What is going on, everybody? Welcome in. Thanks for joining us here at Getting Buzzed. I'm Howard Bender with me here. Of course, Ryan Hallam. Ryan, uh, we, you know, we had to take off last week. Lots of stuff going on here, but we are back. And uh, and happy football day, right? Because as we're recording this right now, oh, baby, it's the Hall of Fame game. Yeah, I got multiple questions today. Are you watching this? And like, I mean, maybe for a little bit, but uh, this is football's back, kind of. Uh, you know, no deck Prescott. It's it's nice to see two national teams, uh, but it's hard to get too excited over the first preseason game. I know there's people playing preseason DFS showdown slates, which is like the height. Come on, who's the who's super sleeper for tonight? I had people this... legit asking me who's my sleeper pick for tonight for DFS. I was like, really? Yeah, no. it's uh, I think Anthony McFarland was the right answer, but no, uh, I, yeah, I can't, I, uh, great, I'm very happy football's back, uh, but I, I'm not playing showdown slate DFS stuff on uh, Steelers Cowboys Thursday night. No, no, we implore patience, people, patience. DFS, listen, when it, when it happens over a fast heel arm this year, week one, oh, baby going to be ridiculous we're going to have a great year yeah. i know we're going to have a great. I'm, I'm so dialed in for this it's going to be incredible and and i'm just i'm super psyched about it um but i'm not playing in the preseason i'm what i'm doing here for the preseason i think you know you're you're probably like this as well ryan you're just this is i'm watching the position battles i'm watching for the names this is more about me for seasonal fantasy football than it is for dfs i mean yes I'm learning certain things that I will utilize for DFS research, but this is all about this is about getting my uh, my fantasy teams uh, going right. So you know you'll see what happens in the preseason games. You get the updates in the fantasy alarm draft guide, which if you don't have it, time's running the hell out. You better get it. Fantasyalarm.com/draft now. Promo code draft now takes 20% off of that. You want everything. You want the DFS. You want the seasonal, the draft guide, the league sync, the this, the that. Um, fantasyalarm.com slash get NFL. Use the promo code Bender. Take 50% off from me to you. You're like Santa Claus. You know, right? Just Except, give, uh, you give to the people. I do. I give to the people. I give to the people. I just don't look good in red. It's not my color, so I can't. I can't put that on. Well, you know what? Switch it up. It's time. Like all traditions are kind of being changed right now in the world, and things are things are being different. So, you know, that purple looks nice on you. Maybe you're Santa Claus in an all purple suit. Um, you know, the purple does always look. You know, it makes my eyes pop. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. Listen, we've got Jeff Radcliffe coming on the show later tonight, and anybody who's anybody knows Jeff Radcliffe, right? He is the dreamiest looking guy in all of fantasy sports. Like, seriously, that quote from Superbad, the first time I looked into his eyes, it was like <laughs> listening to the Beatles for the first time. Like, that's Jeff Radcliffe. So I need to make sure that I'm, I'm sort of at my best here right now. So, yeah, see, dial yourself up. Give me one of these, man. Give me one, right? Yeah. I have no chance. Beautiful. Beautiful. You you don't have any chance. I don't have any chance. It's Jeff Radcliffe. Who's got a chance against Jeff Radcliffe? So some very interesting things about Jeff Radcliffe. I'm very excited to have him on the show today. Um, and as always, we're going to have a lot of fun uh, with him. But uh, let, let's start. If you want to talk about fun here. I mean, I'm, I'm actually surprised that Ryan uh, made it to the show today. I, I get this, this video sent to me uh, and it's apparently on Twitter as well. Yeah, that's it. Have another sip of that beverage there, my friend. I'm going to cheers you on this one. In the realm of what could possibly go wrong, <laughs> Ryan went retro and got himself a pair of rollerblades and is now, uh, <laughs> he's not, I, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that you're, uh, that, that you're here. Like, are you concussed? No, How many fingers I am I holding up right now? 
fourth. What three one? Uh, honestly, you know what? Twenty years ago, like I was really good on him. Like I, you know, me and my brother played some like you know some hockey against the garage door and stuff. Uh, and then you know, obviously, I you know started life and got away from it all. And I don't know what the hell possessed me to to do this again six days before I turned 44 years old. Uh, but yeah, I was like, I think I could do that again. Let, let's, uh, so I got on them the first time the other day. Today was the second time I was on them. I was on them for the first time for about uh, 55 seconds before I was like, all right, this is a little too much. Like my, my calf started hurting and it was like, I almost fell three or four times. I'm like, okay, I'm already on borrowed time. Let's let's just get off it. So today I went back out and I got to say, I felt pretty pretty decent, decent on them. I, I, I Kind of almost went down once or twice, but uh, I, I get my 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 skates under me, and I think uh, you know by the end of the month, I think I'm going to be good on them again. Are you wearing a helmet? No. And but this funny thing was pads, I, knee pads. I you know, and my mom is like totally overbearing and crazy and everything, and she was already telling me like she's going to find knee pads and stuff for me, I'm like. Uh, but no, I'm not planning. You say on... your mom's gonna loan you her knee pads? No, no, she's looking. She wants. Oh, to get... oh God! Wow! God. Oh. <laughs> uh, no. I think I think above all, like this is this is the worst shameless plug to try and get somebody to send you knee pads, elbow pads, and a helmet. Because how you casually drop in, oh, you know, it's only six days before my 44th birthday. That's right. I count down. I don't care how old I am. I always count down to my birthday. Are you a big, you're a big birthday guy? I love it. It's the only holiday that's just for me. Every other holiday, like everyone else has it. Your birthday is your day. Like, you know, and then everybody, I like, you know, I like to have get a big, uh, big deal made out of me on my birthday. Even yeah. if I have to force it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if I you have to force it, <laughs> I had some people. I had some people send me some shit last year from Twitter on my birthday. <laughs> well, I'm gonna shout it out to your daughter, who, uh, in honor of birthdays here, we're gonna have Morgan give me the best birthday present I could possibly have. So, Morgan, if you're out there listening here, video footage of your dad wiping out on his rollerblades. <laughs> my birthday is the day after Christmas. So you got plenty of time here because that's it's not just the fall or anything like that. It's the giddy laughter that we're going <laughs> to hear on top of it all. Like the video is going to shake a bunch because she's laughing. So that is the birthday present I want the most. Uh, and Ryan, I will say that uh, I thank you in advance for You're giving welcome. me the best birthday present ever. I, I think if I do fall, it's going to be one of those slow falls where it's just going to be like, oh, no. You know, it's going to just, like, completely wipe out. So I, I'm hoping to avoid it. I'm hoping if I, like, start to go down, there's at least grass nearby. Uh, so, you know, road rage up this this old-ass body. Brutal. Brutal. Well, stay tuned for that one, folks. We, uh, we might have some of that footage here uh, on the show at some point. <laughs> you definitely want. Because I'm sure you're – not drinking and blading at the same time. I mean, you? not right now. I mean, it's like, like I said, it's the first time I've been on them in probably pretty close to 20 years. Uh, so I'm certainly not pushing the envelope just like that. Give me a little bit of time. Like I told you, I felt pretty good on them today. I don't know if you watched the video I sent you, but, you know, I got a little wobbly a couple times, but most of us, it was like a vast improvement from the other day. It's hard to watch that video. I mean, listen, it was 58 seconds of just, you know, just the view. Like, I didn't even see you and your robot. You didn't even, like, give me, like, a little, like, hey, it's me. I'm trying to stay up. <laughs> I got, I'm the, it's not cinematography here. I'm just trying to stay on my feet. We should have a contest for, for people right now, right? Free subscription to Fantasy Alarms NFL, right? If you can, if you can pick the exact date of Ryan's big wipeout <laughs> that, that we get footage of, that, and and, I'm, and I mean, like, I want to see some I want to see some bloodshed. Like, I want to see some skinned elbows and some skinned knees. I want to see, like, a rip in the pants or something like that. You're having way more fun with this than I anticipated in my in my demise, I have to say. Something tells you that my buddy Morgan's going to have just as much fun as I am. <laughs> no <sighs> doubt. All right. Well, let's – I'll tell you what. Let's uh, – we'll, we'll stop with Ryan and the rollerblades, thankfully. <laughs> Stay safe, Ryan. Wear a helmet, dude. Really wear a helmet.
Come on, yeah. man. We we didn't grow up in an era where you wore helmets. I'm not going to start now. No, we didn't. But, I mean, should we learn something from that, maybe? Probably, you know, like probably. Yeah, taking, so. like, wrought iron and making it into the shape of a rocket ship and telling your kids to, you know, cementing it into blacktop and then telling your kids to climb to the top, probably not the best thing. 95 degree feet. You know, Always great when you landed on the blacktop and like your elbow also like sunk in because it's so hot out. Um, what you look like you're about to say something. I was going to say something. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for rollerblading to become an Olympic sport. No, really, because you're watching the Olympics. Are you watching yes. the Olympics at all? Zero, zero percent. You haven't watched anything. You haven't watched I, synchronized swimming. You I've haven't seen. watched. <laughs> <laughs> right, you saw that video. At the same time, uh, I saw the, the walking out of the stairs, and I was like, "Yeah, I did." That's that's the extent of the Olympics I've seen. Clips that people have taken on Twitter and retweeted with walking into your draft room, like, like that's the extent that I've watched the Olympics. <laughs> I don't give a crap about the Olympics. I haven't given a crap about the Olympics in quite a while. And we're on getting buzz. We don't give a shit about the Olympics in quite a while. I don't care. They're all the same to me. Uh, their skateboarding's a sport. Like it's it's like. I don't even know what the Olympics are. I don't care who wins. I don't know. That doesn't make me less of an American. I just, I just, it's so far off my radar. It doesn't even register at all. Well, good. Then we can, we, we can just file that with the, uh, okay. <laughs> Olympic coverage. Oh, bye bye. <laughs> um, let's, what, how about the MLB trade deadline? Did that interest you at all? That was wild. That was one of the more active MLB trade deadlines that I can remember in in recent years for sure. A lot of uh, lot big moves, big players. I mean, the Cubs unloaded everybody. Uh, you know, the Twins unloaded a few. Like there was there was some pretty big moves. I, I, yeah, that def- definitely uh, got my interest. Did that mess you up more because of the work you do with fanjections, or is it like messing with your fantasy baseball teams? Are you are you in competition for championships in any of your fantasy baseball teams? I was on vacation, so it didn't mess with my fanjections work. It messed with other people's fanjections work. So <laughs> <laughs> that worked out perfectly. How yeah. convenient. <laughs> and I got a message from Grande when I was on vacation. He's like, now I know why you took this week off because of the trade deadline. So I was like, absolutely, you're right. Uh, yeah, I'm still in it for a couple. Uh, you know, my Tout Wars team that started out really well is kind of slowly moving backwards in the head-to-head standings. But there's a couple of, uh, of you know, non-industry leagues that I'm still doing all right in. Okay, good, good, good. Biggest trade that you uh, that, that really messed with your fantasy teams? Not necessarily with, you know, everybody. Was, we all know the trade turner, Max Scherzer to the Dodgers, was like the... You know, well, to the I, rest of the baseball world, but you know, let's talk about uh, a trade that messed up your uh, your fantasy squad. I mean, I don't know that too much mess with my squad. I mean, I've turned her in a couple of leagues. I don't think that really hurts too much. Uh, you know, I didn't really have any of the close. I've got Brad Hand, you know, that got traded. Uh, but I don't think any of them really, like, really screwed me over. I didn't think, you know, nobody that I could think of off the top of my head, and there was a ton of trades. Right. No uh, Kimbrel, really, no Hendricks. Yeah, nothing like that that really uh, – because closers was really the only pl- thing that I could think of off the top of my head that would really mess it. Because most of the guys who moved are going to start just on another team. There are some good, you know, uh, NL to AL moves if you play in one of those mono right. leagues like, you know, some of us old-timers do, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, you're like – you know, Anthony Rizzo and Starling Marte and uh, Brad Hand was the other guy. Craig Kimbrell. Those were the like, the top four that trend, you know, changed over. Um, I did not have enough fab left for AL Tout to get any of them. I don't have a lot left either, to be honest. Terrible. But uh, I, mean, I thought, and you're a Yankee fan, so I want to ask you this question. You know, I know they went out and got Andrew Heaney, who... We we all you know used in in against in DFS, but I I, I kind of thought like. They're so full of home run or nothing guys. Why the heck did they go out and trade for two more home run or nothing guys? I mean, Rizzo can hit for a decent average, but he hasn't in the past couple of years. But uh, it just seemed like they just got more of what they already had. And I, I, was, I didn't understand it either. Okay. I was making sure I wasn't alone. Yeah. No. I mean, you got a bunch of high strikeout, you know, all sink or swim guys. Uh, so you add Joey Gallo to that, right? To add to our strikeout total. Sure. I mean, yeah, Rizzo, you know, OBP wise could be a little bit better and it solidifies us, you know, defensively 
uh, over there at first because it moves LeMayhew over to second. Uh, Torres at short. Um, but, yeah, dude, it's uh, – uh, uh, my Yankees are going to go the same road as your Cardinals. Two yep. tickets to Nowheresville. Yep. Even if they sneak in, they're not doing anything. Yeah, right. Might as well sneak in and lose that one one playoff game. I'm with Super. You. Super. <laughs> um, all right, from the MLB trade deadline to the NFL, let's talk about it here. Uh, a couple of players struggling with injuries uh, coming back. Bark, Saquon Barkley, Joe Burrow, Kenny Galladay, Cortland Sutton, none of the reports coming in on any of these guys has been positive. Barkley could miss uh, the first week of the season at least. Joe Burrow, they say, looks terrible at practice right now. Uh, Kenny Galladay's now got a hamstring issue to dealing with uh, on top of his uh, hip issue. And then Corlin Sutton, uh, still slow coming back on his uh, on his ACL issue. Uh, you drafting any of these guys? I'm not worried about Burrow or Sutton. Uh, the other two worry me a little bit. Burrow, I mean, he tore his ACL. I, if it wasn't late October, it was early November. So, I mean... I think he's just about on track to be good for week one. Uh, you know, if he's not great in practice right now, eh, you know, I'm not really too worried about it. I still think he'd be fine. He's got just weapons up his ass everywhere to throw to. I think the offensive line will be his biggest problem. But I do think that I'm not really worried about Joe Burrow. But, I mean, he's also like a, a super flex or two-quarterback league, you know, high-end second guy. I don't think he's snuck into that top 12, you know, kind of. So if you're in a one quarterback league, you know, Joe Burrow's probably, if you carry two quarterbacks, you're second uh, anyway. And Cortland Sutton's the same thing. He had a long-term injury. Uh, just kicking off some rust, man. We're, we're a month away from week one still. There's going to be some time where these guys, uh, in you know, get back into the flow, get back into some, some you know, actual plays. And, and even though they're still in shorts a lot of times, uh, it's, it's just getting back acclimated. So I'm not too worried about them. Galladay, you know, I did the morning buzz on Wednesday. Uh, I don't know that two and three weeks is terrible, uh, but there's two things that bother me. One, the hip injury from last year, so it lingering into another year starting with an injury bothers me. And two, he's on a new team, you know, with a new quarterback. You'd love to have him have as much time, uh, you know, to to form some sort of chemistry with Daniel Jones as possible. And Saquon Barkley... You know, if he's towards the back end of the first round now, I feel a little more comfortable. Uh, you know, but he's had some injury problems in his career. And the Giants, the, the big fight the other day, uh, the, the whole Giants team kind of seems to be off kilter right now. So the two Giants bother me. The other two guys, I'm still drafting with confidence. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'll tell you what, because I have feelings about all of this, but I'm going right. to save it. I'm going to save it for last call. I'm going to okay. save it for last call. Because, you know, there's some things that are bothering me uh, just about drafting some of these injured guys. So instead of getting aggravated about it, knowing that Jeff Radcliffe's going to be here, so I want to look my best and get my big smile going. Um, yeah, see, again, uh, let's let's go something happier. Let's uh, let's make fun <laughs> of, of, of of sports teams logos over the years. Oh, my God. You know, for our top 10 list. Uh, you know, Ryan and I go back and forth. Ryan's always the master of coming up with uh, with great topics here uh, that we can do. He, this was one that he, he threw out to me, and I was like, yes, this is the one. We got to do it. So, I mean, listen, because because of some of the you know, recent logos and stuff like that that we're looking at, I mean, this it's unbelievable. I don't want to spoil it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Getting Buzzed Top 10. Tonight's top 10 worst sports logos of all time. All time. Um, and I'll let Ryan start it off here with number 10. Oh, number 10. This is one that really bothers me because this. Uh, all right. So it's Washington football team. It's another year we're going into it that they haven't come up with a logo. It's just a W. Just come up with something. I'm happy they finally changed off the Redskins. But you know what? And another team on here changed really quickly without even like you know protests and everything to to get them to change. Just come up with anything. It doesn't matter. Come up with a, a focus group. Come up with three things and just pick a name. Washington football team with the dumb stupid W is just terrible. It pisses me off. Pick something. 
I don't know, man. You know, all the European soccer fans, they're all like, yeah, 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 FC, right? Football club. Why wouldn't you? Because it makes it worse. And it's, it's also too close to what the fuck. It is. Well, that's always every time I see somebody do write WFT, I'm like, why are they writing what the fuck? Oh, it's not what the fuck. Number nine here comes up on the list, um, goes to, to the NHL, the Phoenix Coyotes. I remember when they first joined the uh, joined the NHL, they moved from Winnipeg to Phoenix. Um, and I don't know who the who the brain surgeon was that said, hey, let's take a coyote and let's Picasso this thing. Right. Where so it's it's sort of resembling southwestern art when it's not. And it looks terrible. It's just the worst logo from '97 to 2003. They had Picasso Coyote uh, as their as their logo. It was atrocious, man. It was atrocious. Yeah, definitely, it's all different kind of colors, and it's just like mm, 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 mm. I don't know what they were trying to pull off. And it wasn't like mm, mm, at all. I'm not sure why I just did that. No, it kind of was. <clears throat> I tell you what, you know, our illustrious producer Matt sells right because we're not violating any copyright issues here. Show me. The Phoenix Coyotes logo. Yeah, that's gross. Yeah, really that's bad. Gross. It was like it's a bad trip kind of uh, look on the NHL. Speaking of bad trips, bad looks on the NHL, I got to go to number eight. Uh, the New York Islanders in, in 1996 decided that they were going to go with a threatening version of the Gordon's Fisherman, uh, <laughs> right? Um, holding a hockey stick, looking all angry. Um, Captain Fish Sticks is what they ended up calling him. Uh, it was an absolute disaster. Right? I, thought, I mean, I just, thought you just put that as something funny. I didn't know that's what they actually. No, did. people started calling it Captain Fish Sticks. Listen, you, you talk to Justin Fensterman, right? I'm, Welcome Fensty back from, you know, when he, when he finally returns from, you know, being a stay at home dad. Uh, yeah. Talk to him about Captain Fish. You say Captain Fish Sticks, he'll be like, "Oh, well, he was like the worst." I thought it was the guy from. I thought it was the guy from when I knew what you did last summer was their their logo. Might as well have been him too. Number seven, we go back into the well. We go to the first time to the NBA, and this is uh back in the eighties and early nineties, and it's the Denver Nuggets, their cityscape, but it was all different kinds of rainbow colors, and it looked awful lot like a game of Tetris. I never understood it. I never understood. I don't know what city has those kinds of lights where it was just, but I still, you know, you get the Matumbo in there. It was still a little intimidating. They were, you know, they maybe they were ahead of their time, right? Where they were like LED panels that they thought that they were, were were hitting us with, but no, no bueno there. Rainbow Tetris logo, uh, no good. Although I bet you fensty has got that jersey somewhere, right? Oh, absolutely. That guy's got. I didn't realize until recently like how many basketball jerseys he had. And it, I don't think they really look good on normal people. I don't want to say it. I, I'm hoping he's not watching this. But basketball jerseys, I've found, don't really look good on normal people. So uh, maybe we should move on to number six. And this is one of my least favorite teams in all of sports, and that is the Seattle Seahawks. I don't know what a Seahawk really is, but I'm telling you that's Gonzo from the Muppets. That's their logo, right? <laughs> it is Gonzo. It does look like him a little bit. And I remember when when they the Seahawks were going to like change the logo and update the logo. This is probably like, what, 10 years ago? All they did was change the color scheme. Yes. They left the logo the exact same thing. Like, this was your chance to like undo this hideous god awful thing, and uh, no, they just changed the colors, which is fine because screw that team, I hate them. Screw that team, I hate them. All right, number five, guy, this one here, this this is hysterical. Google, well, we don't have to Google it. Matt Sells can put this one up here. The Milwaukee Brewers logo from 1970 to 77 looked like you know, I mean, I get like the barrel shaped body. But it was like it's the Tin Man from like the Wizard of Oz, but he's wearing a pair of shorts or pants or whatever, hiked up so much that it's like nothing but camel toe. And I'm like, you know, I don't understand this at all. Like this logo makes no sense whatsoever. Like it doesn't, it doesn't look like somebody. Like are there robots working in breweries? 
Yes. And they're taking the pitcher yard is what they're doing. But oh. yeah, absolutely. He he, uh, he certainly had to pick those shorts out of various different areas. And that was didn't look comfortable at all. I, and that was like it was like John Stockton in a robot suit. <laughs> Whatever it was, dude, it was it was it was gross. Bunch of bunch of crotch crevices just glaring at you. Don't Too need much. to see that. Don't. No, no. Number four, it's coming in. This might be my hatred for the club, the organization in general. But, you know, how intimidating is it to see a colonial guy who's like juiced up on steroids hiking a football? Yeah, Patriots, right? What year was that? 1961 to 1992. Garbage. I'm not honestly sure that their new one is that much better as with the Patriots swoosh guy with just kind of like the the just a little bit more updated it's a little hipper you know it's yeah uh, it's it's hipper but it's still not great dude the other one looks like like a a third grader drew it (laughs) it's like oh my lady let me hike this football to you or i don't know that was (laughs) terrible let's move on to number three even worse was the 1976 to 1996 Tampa Bay Bucks? Not only were they creamsicle colored, but the the pirate had the real fancy hat on with the feather and a knife in his mouth, and he was just winking at you. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Like, is he trying to intimidate you? Is he trying to get you on a date? Is he gonna roofie you? Like, I don't know what he was trying to do with this feather hat and the knife in the mouth and the winky face, but. Uh, I know we kind of have like a nostalgia for for old uniforms, but take a good look at that. Uh, take a good look at that logo. It's it's really really weird. That is actually what Captain Morgan looks like when he roofies you, right? <laughs> I get a, a a Captain and Coke, the roofie at the bottom of it, and then all of a sudden everybody's like <laughs> in the creamsicle. Then uh, number two, dude. It's I mean this to me is one of the worst. It's the Cleveland Browns. It's no logo. First of all, not only is it no logo, it's just the color. The helmet's orange. It's not even brown. What the fuck is that? Oh, well, here we go. Because they know it's named after the owner, but it's like, oh, we're going to come up with the Cleveland Browns, and and we're not going to have any sort of logo, and we're just going to make the helmet orange. That'll be weird since we're the Browns. Like, I got nothing here. I have no idea. So It's it's the worst. Too existential for you, right? That no logo is actually the logo. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I have no words for this one. Right? <laughs> Let me take that copy of Waiting for Godot and throw that out as well. Last one here, and this is the one that inspired the entire uh, top 10 here for me. Uh, coming to a theater near you in 2022. Welcome to the Cleveland Guardians. All right, listen, Guardians I can live with. You can do something with that, right? You show me like a like a superhero, right? Isn't there like Guardian insurance where it's like a guy who's got like a shield or whatever? Yeah. So you come up with something, you know, of, of that. This logo, it looks legit like a seven, second grade art class. Right. And they're all you're looking at them all. It's like design a logo for your new favorite baseball team. And like you're looking through them all and you're like this G that's like hugging a baseball. Right. It's like a G with wings and whatever is hugging a bit. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, It legit looks ridiculous. Like, I'm sorry, but in this day and age with the graphic designers, the the, the talent that's out there. This is what the Cleveland Guardians came up with? Dude, that's like, I mean, you just, you, you that's a merchandising nightmare. I don't really understand. Like, I feel like the more teams that have changed their logo in recent times, they just get worse and worse. Like the Rams. What was that, the L.A. swoosh that they, like, every logo that's kind of changed over the last three to five years, it just keeps getting worse and worse. So maybe the computer graphics are, are a hindrance to making something good rather than, you know, you would think, that we could make cooler stuff with it. I'm like, where's I'm waiting for Comic Sans to be like the font of like what, like Dude, what? This, I, I don't this know logo was drawn with an etch a sketch. It was bad. It's bad. <laughs> but like, I guess I'm saying they're they've all been bad. I don't know, is there a lack of creativity? Is it the uh, the programs that we're using? I'm not sure what. 
but uh, yeah, we certainly need uh, some some upgrade in logo creation in the near future. Seriously, seriously. Ugh, ugh, ugh. I don't even. Ugh. There you go. That's our top ten worst logos in sports. Yeah, I I don't even. You can read read them on the screen here. And you know what, Matt? Show show them that that Brewers guy again with the camel toe. Give him one more shot of that one. That's just oh man. Nobody needs to see that. All right. From the biggest eyesore in the world of that Brewers logo to the most handsome man in fantasy sports, you guys know him from the Jeff Radcliffe show on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. That's Monday through Friday uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern, right? 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, the Jeff Radcliffe show. He is also the man behind all of that great data work that you see at FTN and FTN Daily. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest tonight, Mr. Jeff Ratcliffe. <music> Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Joining us here on Getting Buzzed. Always get, uh, It's always a, a, a great time when you and I get to see each other at you know, the conferences that we go to. Um, I know I give you a lot of crap being the most handsome man in the fa- fantasy industry, but you know it's true, dude. You know it's true. I I don't. I, there's a lot of handsome guys, especially this young generation. You know these uh, the millennial guys just bring it. They they got the hair game on point. You know all of them. They're so young. I mean, we used to be the young guys, and now we're like we're the are we the middle aged guys even at this point? I mean, there's still some old guys around, but uh, I appreciate the the kind words. We've had many. Great conversations, though, late night conversations, including uh, some Grateful Dead conversations, which are always fun. So always good times with you, Howard. I appreciate you. Wait a second. Wait a second. A couple times I've been places with Howard. He disappears at seven o'clock and then he's gone for the night. You've had late night conversations with Howard? Because he's hanging out with me. (laughs) And it must be. (laughs) Ryan, Ryan, Ryan and I met at one conference together where I broke my foot, traveled across country and then swallowed a bottle of pain pills after after calling an auction for like all the old school like fantasy baseball people. So yeah, I crapped out. I remember we were sitting at, we were, we were at a bar having some pizza. I think Lisa Ann brought and Ronis brought us over some pizza. Yep. Some good stuff like that all around. But I defy you. I defy you. Tell me one fantasy analyst out there right now who's better looking than you jeff come on uh, I, I we'd be here for the entire show give me uh, one give me well, one we, we say and certainly <laughs> male i'm not talking female male no, come on who is it there's nobody out there don't it's not jeff mans it ain't me it certainly isn't ryan i'm i'm looking at john no hansen's little crew he's got a bunch of crooners over there scott barrett graham barfield look at those guys man Graham oh, Barfield wakes Graham Barfield, up and his hair looks like that. It's just phenomenal. He's like, ah, oh, I just ran my ha- my fingers through it and I look like this. Yeah. All right. I'll give you Graham Barfield. I will. <laughs> Definitely. So, so Jeff, talk to us here, man. Like, I always love bringing people on here. They can tell their story, share with everybody, like how it all started, like where it all began, because there was life of Jeff Radcliffe pre pro football focus. So how did you end up like falling into this uh, into the industry? And that's a great way of saying it. Fall into it. Uh, I feel bad for every so often I'll get like a high school kid or a college kid shoots me an email or or hits me up on Twitter, or LinkedIn, whatever, and says, "How do I get to where you are?" And my my response is like, "You can't necessarily." I, I didn't plan on this. I didn't major in fantasy football, or <laughs> I didn't even major in broadcasting. I had a radio show. I went into college saying I wanted a radio show. And, of course, I didn't do it, right? Freshman year, didn't do it. Junior, Sophomore, junior year, didn't do it. Senior year, I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do this. I know that freshmen are the ones who get the, you know, they, they, they are the low man on the totem pole. They get the crappy times. But I did it. I ended up having a show for that entire year, and I loved it. But I never thought I'd do it again, right? Radio was not even a thought in my mind. I went to uh, grad school for sociocultural anthropology. I actually have a PhD that I finished up in in 2012. I started in 2003, though, so it it was a a nine-and-a-half-year process from start to finish, (laughs) right out of undergrad, into the fire. 
And uh, during that time was the poker boom, right? Chris Moneymaker, all that. So I played poker with friends. Then I started going to Atlantic City and then playing online and got really into it. But then the bubble burst, right? And during that time, I did write a little bit about it. It was okay. I wasn't very good. I know there's so many people in the fantasy industry who have that same background who are much better poker players than me. But I wrote a little bit about it. You know, and then somewhere around 2010, so I was in the thick of dissertation work, which means I was in the thick of procrastination work. Uh, anything I could do to not work on the dissertation, I was pretty much doing. And I thought, you know, maybe I could write about fantasy football because I'd been playing for a little over a decade at that point, And I finally understood it. You know, it wasn't like I just show up at a draft with somebody's rankings from a magazine and just shoot from the hip. Like I was really starting to understand some strategies and really starting to get into football, you know, off the deep end. And I thought, maybe I could write about it. So I looked around, and, you know, it's funny. In 2010, it's like fantasy football jobs. They were just growing on trees, right? <laughs> there was nothing out there. But one site called Fantasy DC had, um, you know, a little job posting for volunteer work. So I shot the guy an email, and he said, you know, uh, I, and it was, I, I had a writing sample about Beanie Wells. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> he's like, I was like making this like Alan Fanica artic, uh, argument of like why Beanie Wells is going to be good. It was just, it was crap. I, I, I have, to have to have it saved somewhere. But anyway, the guy was like, you know, it, I have this site, but I'm actually going to be moving on to something else if you can wait until August. So it was August of 2010. This was June when I talked to him. Uh, so 11 years ago is basically when this launched a PFF. The guy, the mystery guy who I'm talking about is Mike Clay. And it's hilarious at the time. I didn't know him. You know, a lot of people think that like him and I are like best friends from way back when. I didn't know him before this. I even reached out in the email and I called him Mr. Clay, which is <laughs> hilarious to me at this point. But I got in at the ground floor at PFF and there was no pay. We didn't even have a subscription. We weren't even actually technically part of PFF. We were PFF fantasy. We were like allowed to be on pff but we weren't a part of the group right it was it was a total separate entity and i really kind of busted my butt for the first year remember uh writing articles and and saying like okay i've had three articles published now i've had four now i've had five and i was like so proud every every time one went up no ambition to do anything more than that and then there was an opportunity like so mike had already kind of established himself as like an up-and-comer and they said, I need somebody to do IDP. And I played in IDP leagues. I was by no means an IDP expert, but I was like, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I want to be the best in the world at this. So I set out to do that. And I don't know if I ever achieved it, but I won a bunch of accuracy. I learned how to do projections through all of that and, and had a podcast and all that stuff and, and was still working on the offensive stuff. And luckily, because of IDP, though, I got hired at Roto World where I got to work with like, it was, you know, the late Chris Wessling, you know, rest his soul, uh, got to work with Adam Levitan, got to work with Evan Silva, got to work with Roto Pat, Pat Doherty, like all these great minds learned how to write news blurbs, learned how to process everything. And that just took it to another level. And then it was kind of off to the races. Like I'm, I'm telling like the entire story, but that was literally how I started two and a half years of making absolutely no money, then maybe making a tiny little bit of money and working even harder. And then luckily about six years in, everything kind of fell into place. And, and that's when things really went to another level. Yeah, that's that's something that, that people nowadays trying to break into the industry, they don't get. I mean, you know, I, I, I understand that the landscape of the industry has changed. But to go in there, like and anybody who thinks that they're getting into the content side of fantasy um, and they're going to make great money doing it is like, I mean, <laughs> ridiculously delusional right there. It's just not where the it's not where the money is. And you really have to, like, put in all of that time and pay those dues to, yeah, to get where you are right now. Chilling out. You got the the, the Jeff Radcliffe show is Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Right. So it's a two hour show there. Um, all the podcasts, everything, you know, all the stuff that you're doing on uh, on FTN now. Right. I mean, you've got you got a full plate. I mean, the day starts bright and early for you. 8 a.m., I'm sure. And doesn't stop until what? Six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Maybe if you're going to grab some dinner. Got, got to get on that treadmill at six thirty because uh, the t TV is not uh, kind if you're uh, 
even a little bit over <laughs> overweight, and that's coming up pretty soon too. The CBS thing was hilarious. So they reached out. I have like a Facebook business page that I don't use anymore, you know, because I basically use Twitter and Instagram. And this was in 2016. Some guy writes me like a one line email on there, like, hey, I'm from CBS. We want to bring you in for an audition. I'm like, yeah, okay, buddy. Like, yeah, right. It was legitimately real. And now this will be my sixth year on that other pregame show, CBS Sports Network, which is kind of hard to believe as well. But Howard, I mean, you make a, an interesting point. Like, yes, the grind. And every so often, if, like, somebody finds out what I do, they they have this, like, image in their mind. Like, I, I don't know, like a 90s Dr. Dre video is going on every time we're working. <laughs> like, we just open up a fridge full of 40 ounces and – no, it, it is not glamorous. It is you sitting in a room by yourself a lot of times. It's it's sometimes it's sacrificing when your friends are out doing stuff where you, you know I've I've missed a couple family events because there's other things that I have to do. Unfortunately, it's it's not a glamorous profession, but I'm not complaining at all. It's it's not a bad way to earn a living. It's just not what some people think it is. Absolutely. Like uh, Thanksgiving, there's football. Christmas, a lot of times there's football. So obviously every weekend there's football. So absolutely. I, I, I know that as well. Like uh, people want to come in, they want to work Monday through Friday, nine to five. And that is not what this is at all. If you want to be successful. Uh, but part of the story that I, I caught here that, that I want to ask you about uh, is you say you have a PhD. Uh, is that in PPR? Is that in half point PPR standard? Like what is your, where's your PhD <laughs> land in? Doctor, so, doctor, it, Dr. Radcliffe. It's, yeah, I, that's a weird one, too, that doesn't really register. Occasionally, I do have a couple family members who will call me that. But for the most part, it's like out, out of sight, out of mind. But it, it, it's, it, it's in cultural anthropology. You know, I wrote a dissertation, I explored uh, a small sort of fringe uh, city in the Philadelphia suburbs called Norristown. And I looked at the intersection of pump, hunger and poverty in Norristown and really what I wanted to do is explore broader understandings of capitalism, like capitalist ideology that played out through uh, the the way we talk about the diet. It, I know it's like it, it's a lot fancier than what it sounds. But I think in a lot of ways, the, the, the reason why I approach fantasy analysis the way that I do is, is because of the background in anthropology. My, my objective always was to not sound super smart or anything like that. I wanted to explain complex subjects to everybody and sometimes fantasy football can be that way when we use some of these fancy you know a dot and you know dvoa and all this stuff like if i said that to just somebody who, who really isn't in the thick of things they probably won't know what i'm saying and they don't fantasy is supposed to be fun right they don't want to go to school when it comes to fantasy football so I, every time I mention a dot, I say, "Oh yeah, that you know, that's just how far downfield they're targeted from the line of scrimmage." Now, okay, whoa, that's actually pretty cool. Oh, so a guy like Michael Thomas or a guy like Juju Smith-Schuster isn't targeted very far downfield, whereas a guy like Mike Evans is, and then that can be a factor, right? So, it's weird, you know. Matthew Barry, when he wrote his book, there's a line in that book, that Fantasy Life book, where he said, uh, "You know, when you get your chance, just make sure you're ready." And, and that is like I get I get chills just saying that um, I was ready for the opportunities when they came because of all these things that I had done in the past, standing in front of a classroom. To, there were times where I would have to do three hour long classes. So it was just me doing like a three hour long lecture. I feel bad for those students, but I had to do it. <laughs> uh, writing, you know, I had to write a book for the dissertation. I had to write so many papers. Those are part of it all. Uh, all the presentation, all the way of how to present the material, all of that, the bad jokes. Because sometimes as a professor, you got to slip some bad jokes in there, which my show is full of them. It's always great because I'm the only person there. So I laugh at them, but I know nobody else does. <laughs> as I just did right there. But uh, all of that, you know, when it came time for that door to open up that I never thought would have opened up because I never would have even set out to do this, I was actually ready for it, even though the training wasn't directly for the job. Dude, I, you know, and I, and I love that you bring that up because that's one of the things that we we talk about at Fantasy Alarm all the time is that, you know, one of the things that Jim Bowden and I talk about on the air is that, We've, we're speaking, we have to speak to Bob from accounting yep. who, you know, joined the, the, the fantasy football league in the office because he wanted to hang out with the guys, right? Like that kind of a thing. 
And and that's not the person who is absorbing, you know, a dot and yak and all the other uh, all the all the other the the different metrics now that uh, that everybody's using. So I can definitely appreciate that. I try it for fantasy baseball all the time too. I write an article being like, listen, here's here's the stat, here's the formula. Who cares? This is what you're looking for. Like you don't need to understand how they calculate weighted on base average. You just have to know that you're looking for a number right around 350. Like, and that's that's you know the the kind of way that I I feel like we need to approach metrics here, even in football. You know, I mean, it's definitely a rise that we're seeing. But I mean, I love the fact that you do that. I do, and nobody laughs at my jokes either, Jeff. I, it's crickets well, I on a regular basis. Not at all. No. Always, always. I'm like, is Jim even on the air with me right now? Because he <laughs> should be laughing, <laughs> and he's not laughing. Um, all right. So, Jeff, we love to get to know people even beyond the professional world here. Um, I asked you for some fun facts. And the one that I mean, listen, there are a couple of them that really stuck out to me. But the one that really stuck out to me is that you make your own bread and yeah. you've been doing it now for five years. Now, I'm watching this show on uh, Netflix where somebody has like a like a mason jar with like a starter for a sourdough and everything. So now all I'm thinking of is like, if I go into Jeff Radcliffe's refrigerator, uh-huh. am I getting like all of these bread starters and stuff? How, how much of an obsession is this? Well, I don't have the bread starters. Um, I actually just use, you know, active dry yeast. And really where it came from, it, you know, mentioned, you mentioned Netflix. My wife and I got into uh, that the British baking show and Paul Hollywood and all that. Mm-hmm. Where this was a while back. I mean, now it's obviously it's it's an institution at this point. But we loved it, and I was like, you know what? I, I should try and do this because I've I'm like a carb guy. I love bread. I've always loved bread. I love sandwiches, and I was like, I want to make my own sandwich bread. So I came upon uh, Julia Child's uh, sandwich bread recipe, and I was like, let's go. And it took a while to really kind of get it down. But at this point, yeah, I can do those all the time. I've done a whole bunch of different types of, of breads. I mainly, I'll probably make. I, I used to do it about every week, but now I, maybe it's twice a month where I'm doing the sandwich bread. Uh, you know, family gatherings there, and then I I've done cakes and all that stuff too. So it's not just limited to bread. But I think it's it's cool. It's it's you know, I'm a DIY type of person. If I can make something myself or do something myself, then I'd rather than go out and buy it. And man, there is nothing better than when that bread comes out of the oven. Now you got to wait, you got to give it about a half hour because it's still kind of cooking on the inside. But when you break that open, there is nothing better than homemade fresh bread with all real ingredients. It's fantastic. So, so what, what are you making? Like, I mean, you know, how's your brioche game? Am I, should I be asking that? What about nope, um? Nope. What about like uh, some uh, something bagels? Creative? I bagels from scratch as well. I, I love my bagels. I actually just did some Philly pretzels uh, from scratch. Uh, I have done English muffins. They they're a fan favorite as well. Uh, I have done well. I guess I've done some brioche rolls. I haven't done like a brioche actual loaf, but I've done rolls for sandwiches. Um, you know, pizza doughs as well. I'll make a pizza dough that actually sits in the refrigerator and proofs for, you know, 48 hours before we actually use it. So it's a New York style pizza dough. Lots of fun stuff, man. Damn. Uh, I know. I'm fucking hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan gets belligerent when he gets hungry. Me and now I'm like, I'm like, damn. Like, you know, now I need to like order some of these online. Do you have like right? a website? Yeah. Like, can I go, can I go like log on to my account on FTN Daily and like find like, you know, when I order like a, a, a shirt or something like that, that I can get like a, a, a loaf of sourdough? Right. Give Kevin loads. Adams any ideas, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is an entire arm of the business that they're missing out on. Our esteemed I'm ready, CEO. I'm ready, yeah. I'm ready to put, uh, I'm ready to put my order in right now. I want to, yeah, I want to order these English muffins. That, yeah, I'm, that, I'm intrigued. That, that, and the, the English pizza muffins dough. are nice. Yeah, English muffin and pizza dough. That's what I'm. That's what I want. It's, it, it's a multi-stage process. So English muffins have to be a little bit sour. Now I don't use a sourdough starter for anything. I did try that a couple times. Don't really like it, uh, but they do have to be a little bit sour. You can introduce sourness in a couple different ways. 
But the the interesting thing is they are actually like, you're in a griddle first. You put them in a, a cast iron uh, pan, you griddle them, then you bake them. So, mm. you know, bagels, obviously a little bit different. You got to boil those first, then bake them. So all, it's just the process. To me, anytime that I don't have to be thinking about certain other things, you know, it's just that little bit of an escape for a half hour. I, I don't mind it, you know. Howard I'll introduces sourness every Monday through Friday from six to there eight. There you go. I do. I <laughs> definitely do. But I, listen, I'm, now I'm like, now I want to run like a like a fantasy auction. But I want to like auction off shit like thirty minute baking lesson with Jeff Radcliffe, right? And forget about what you. I don't care who your keepers are or anything like that. Like, do that kind of a thing where I get like everybody with all their different, you know, fun stuff. Ah. Right, That's singing cool. lessons with Jen Piacenti, there baking lessons here with Jeff Radcliffe. Well, I love it. Well, Jeff, so what we like to do is we like to play a little game uh, with all of our contestants based on certain things there, and uh, and and I'm taking your bread making to a, a different level, if you okay. will. Um, this name of this game is called Leavened or Unleavened. All right. Okay. And, <laughs> Brian and I, right? Bre Wonder Bread or matzah? Either way, <laughs> here we go. Um, which of these players in a position battle will rise to the occasion? Uh, uh, see what you did there. See what I did there? Thank you. Thank you very much. Somebody out there is watching this and actually laughing at that joke. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'll start off. I'm going to start off in your backyard, dude, based on a, a comment that I saw today. Uh, that Miles Sanders and Boston Scott are going to be basically splitting touches uh, this week. Miles Sanders and Boston Scott, which one's going to rise to the occasion? Well, if you mean uh, rise as in have the higher amount of touches, I still think it's going to be Miles Sanders. I don't think this should be any surprise to anybody who's following Philadelphia Nick Sirianni was the offensive coordinator last year with the Colts. We know what the Colts like to do. They like to split that backfield up. You have an early down runner. It was Marlon Mack initially, then Jonathan Taylor, you know, over the last couple of years here, and obviously last year with Jonathan Taylor, you have a passing down back. That was Naeem Hines. This is what NFL offenses want to do in most instances. And when you look at these two guys who figures to be more of the early down back, not Boston Scott, Miles Sanders, and then Boston Scott, or at some point, maybe Kenny Gainwell, eventually if he takes over, I still think Kenny Gainwell was a steal on day three of the draft. That's going to be your passing down back. So it's, it's easy to really overreact. You know, a lot of times I open my show up with like, you know, sort of a, a monologue of words of wisdom. And today I kept going back to the theme of react but don't overreact. And yes, we should react to this in that we shouldn't be having Miles Sanders where we had in the past, but he still is an RB2, not a high ceiling guy, but still an RB2, just kind of a little boy. He's in that running back dead zone that people keep talking about right now. So it will be Sanders. I love Boston Scott just as a player, but uh, it, it Sanders is going to have more touches. All right, let's go from the backfield to the quarterback. And this is one that... Uh, it's really, really kind of grinds me, but I'm hoping that you give me the answer that I want, and that's in New Orleans. I don't think we're going to give it to you. <laughs> Jameis Winston or, Tam or Taysom Hill. Please, please, after watching Taysom Hill last year, please tell me he's not going to be the starting quarterback. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to be Team Taysom. Oh, no. No, I no. agree. Taysom didn't pass the audition for me. Not at all. Yes, he won games. It ain't baseball. It doesn't – quarterback record is the one of the worst things you can look at out there because it's simply saying, oh, yeah, there's not 10 other guys on the field, plus the defense. Let's forget, you know, let's forget about the 11 other guys playing defense. Taysom Hill tr changed the offense so dramatically from where they were with Drew Brees – and, and also it became problematic because he cannibalized off of their now certainly best offensive weapon as long as Michael Thomas is hurt in Alvin Kamara. Now, Jameis had some trouble going through the, the pad drill, <laughs> but yes. he also, though, I think gives them a better chance to run the offense they want to run. Now, I will also kind of you know say, acknowledge that Will Jameis be the quarterback for the entire season? Maybe not. You know, maybe it does get bad quickly. Some of the old Jameis habits come back around and they pull him. I will say this, though. Jameis threw a lot of interceptions the last time he was out there. 
I actually think that's a product of something good. Now, a lot of times, you know, people will say interceptions are going to be bad all the time. Jameis throws these interceptions because he's so utterly, insanely confident in his ability to make throws that nobody can make that he throws interceptions. So it's coming from a good place. They just really need to harness that. And I don't know if they can, but I do ultimately think that he came back to that team for a reason and he ends up being the starter for that team. God, I hope so. Taysom Hill was completely unwatchable for those four <laughs> weeks. I think he's terrible. Like you said, he's not even a real quarterback. He just, just the offense just went in mud for those weeks. So I'm really, really hoping they give Winston the chance to to throw the ball. To be fair, one of those weeks was against Denver, who was starting a wide receiver from yeah. their practice squad at quarterback, <laughs> which still, I mean, not to knock him because that was freaking awesome of right. uh, Hinton. But, you know, that that was a mess. But, no, I agree with you 100%. The offense just it looked so flat. Like, even a completely arm-dead Drew Brees was moving the offense with, with you know, much more ease uh, than Taysom Hill. And, you know, even uh, Mickey Rooney came out and, uh, you know, said – that uh, essentially, or Mickey Loomis, Mickey Rooney. That would be great if Mickey Rooney came out and said anything. <laughs> I was waiting right now. for the correction on that. I didn't want to interrupt you. You, you can tell. So roll. this is this is actually like a half hour past my bedtime right now. Mickey <laughs> Rooney, hey, uh, Mickey Loomis came out and said uh, about Taysom Hill that he is a good football player. And I thought that was a really telling quote. Now, is he playing the, we're not going to call him a quarterback because if we call him a quarterback, then contracts, blah, blah, blah. Or is he legit saying, like, we view him as a football player. We view him as a guy who can play, like, 16 different positions, but we don't yep. really view him as a quarterback. I don't know, but the quote is out there, and I thought it was a very telling choice of words. <laughs> Mickey Rooney. <laughs> Mickey Rooney, come on. He's a classic, right? Is he still alive? No, I, I don't think, think he so. is. I don't. And Andy Rooney isn't alive either. No, no. <laughs> what about Ed Rooney, the principal from uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Mm, that's a I good question. Know. Still what alive. The, I think. Who's the actress Rooney? Mara Rooney? Is she? There's another Rooney. There's one. No, you're thinking of Rosemary Clooney. No, there's a Rooney. Clooney. But anyway. <laughs> what about Jerry Cooney, the boxer? I think he's alive. Are you anyway, sure about movie. that? No, I'm not sure about that, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I want to stay at the quarterback position here, Jeff. Who's going to rise to the occasion? Drew Locke, Teddy Bridgewater. So, uh, yet again, and, and I love this. So, I, I call him the general manager, George Patton, of the Denver Broncos. Nobody gets that joke still. Eventually, somebody's going to laugh when I do that. <laughs> the general manager, uh, uh, George Patton, said that uh, they brought Teddy Bridgewater in so that they could have a pro uh, around Drew Locke. So it's interesting. He said a whole bunch of things about Bridgewater, but ultimately it was still framed around Drew Locke. Again, it doesn't mean anything. I'm not quite sure. But they, they did actually say that to uh, the Sirius XM NFL radio yesterday. So I still I'm inclined to think it's going to be Drew Locke. Drew Locke has one major problem. It's not athleticism. It's not arm strength. It's the fact that he needs a receiver to be open to throw it to him. And receivers aren't open in the NFL. <laughs> you know, if that happens, then the corner fell or something. But right. they're just not open. You have to throw with anticipation. He's always had a problem with that. Teddy can do it. But Teddy Two Gloves doesn't have the arm. He doesn't have the upside that Locke has. So I do think it's Locke. Uh, I, I kind of, you know, I'm kind of hoping it's Locke as well for fantasy purposes. Because I think he gives more juice for Cortland Sutton, for Jerry Judy, for maybe KJ Hamler if he can stay healthy. For Noah Fant as well. So I really would love to see them take the training wheels off Noah Fan. I agree. And Rudy Mara was who I was thinking of. I uh, Googled while you are talking. Uh, but let's stay in Denver. Let's go from the quarterback to the backfield. And that's uh, Javante Williams, a rookie, and Melvin Gordon, the uh, veteran that no one ever likes in fantasy. Nobody likes him. Yeah, and no, Melvin Gordon doesn't like me. Um, I once uh, tweeted something out about him, not in a disparaging way, just said that his uh, – Touchdown efficiency was un unsustainable, and um, he said, we'll see about that, and then he proceeded to hold out. So, uh, you know, I guess <laughs> there's an <entry. laughs> um, If you're watching Melvin Gordon, maybe we'll solve it one of these days. But uh, I, it's Javante Williams and maybe even from the gate. They drafted him for a reason. He was 
you know, almost a first round pick. He wasn't dra- You know, I know we'll say, okay, well, uh, Najee Harris and Travis Etienne were first rounders, and Williams was a second rounder. But there's not a lot of picks that separated them ultimately. So right there with those guys from a talent standpoint, the team made the statement of we're not keeping a 27 year old Philip Lindsay. We do have Melvin Gordon here, but we need to move on. And so we're going to bring in a three down guy who, you know, this this guy, I mean, there's so much upside with him that he very well could be in a full blown committee right from the gate. We know let's let's not take uh, you know, let's not get too crazy about rookies in September, but he's going to blow by Melvin Gordon. And ultimately, Melvin Gordon is going to be an afterthought. Like, I I don't even know where the value breaking point in a fantasy football draft for Melvin Gordon is for me. Like, I'm not taking him where he's going. I'm not going to take him in the fifth round where, where he's going, sixth round. I think if he's there in, like, the 12th, maybe, <laughs> I'd think about it. He's not going to be because of the name brand recognition. But, yeah, Williams is going to certainly rise in that backfield. All right. Let me give you one more here. Staying in the running backs. San Francisco, my backyard here. Trey Sermon, Raheem Mostert. Similar situation for you here? Somewhat similar, slightly different. Uh, the role for, for, for Sermon right out of the gate sounds like it is going to be that early down role. Maybe Jeff Wilson would have been slotted into that. Had he been healthy, he's going to be popped, and then we don't know from there. Mostert is already taking preventative measures, by the way. He's already wearing a knee brace. Like, he's not hurt, but he's like, I'm going to get hurt, so I might as well try and cut this he one off. He was like, I am not hurt. I've always worn this knee brace. You stop tweeting about it. Oh, he was man. so pissed the other yeah. day. Yeah, it, you know, John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan came out and said, we prioritize medicals a little bit more than we did in the past. They also went out and drafted two running backs. I mean, that's really telling. In today's NFL, that's really telling. I, I don't think Elijah Mitchell is somebody who we necessarily need to be focusing on intently, but we do need to know that name. He's he's kind of a Matt Breda type in, in a lot of ways, and we know how well that does in that offense. But Trey Sermon set up for success. And the thing I love about Trey Sermon, he was buried on depth charts, like not buried, but like log jams throughout his college career. Finally gets a chance to shine down the stretch last year and shine he did. So not a lot of wear and tear on him, knows the offense, more athletic than people give him credit for. They trade up to get him on day two, a day two running back. That's something we should take note of early on 35, 40 percent of, of, uh, you know, snaps somewhere in that range and and, uh, carries. But eventually, if Moster gets hurt or if Sermon just shows like, hey, you got to keep me on the field. He's going to take over in that run game. We used to say this, Howard, you remember this? And, and Ryan, I'm sure you remember this as well uh, with, with uh, Mike Shanahan. Remember, oh, put me behind that offensive line. I'll run for 1,000 yards. Well, it wasn't just the offensive line. It was the system. It was the scheme that was creating all those wonderful uh, Denver run games. It's San Francisco now. Like, how many runs did those guys, anybody who was back there, Anybody was back there last year. You you see them ripping off 25-yard runs left and right, whether it was Jarek McKinnon, Raheem Mostert, Jeff Wilson, Tevin Coleman. All of these guys were doing it last year. So I'm excited for Trey Sermon. He's going to rise. I happen to be a 49er fan uh, as well. Uh, so I know that no team – well, probably no team runs better than them. And Shanahan also puts guys in positions with, with you know, motion and all of that to, to run better than anybody else. So – uh, I also think that that Sermon's got a real good chance to get the pass catching because that's not Mostert's strong suit as well. So uh, even if they're splitting even close to 50-50 early, I think Sermon's going to have a nice value. But I agree that I think he's going to pass them. Mostert's really fast. He when, is very fast. When, when somebody's chasing too. him and nobody's tackling him, he's super fast. Uh, I'm going to go one more here, and I'm going to go running back. And this is kind of one that was a question mark last year, and I don't really feel like it's been – clarified anymore this year and that's a buffalo and that's zach moss and devin singletary which one do you think is going to rise we're hit we're giving you all the doozies here jeff we're like (laughs) come on earn your your keep buddy earn it bread man come on can can we say just josh allen is that an acceptable answer (laughs) i mean the problem with those guys is in weeks where they played together both of them were outside of the top 30 in fantasy scoring among running backs. They, it is the true cannibalization backfield. So I've gotten asked that question of like, which one would you rather? And I'd say neither. You know, I, I honestly, 
Who's going in the same range? Like Fournette and Ronald Jones, right? I'd rather take either one of them. I'm leaning Fournette because of Lombardi, Lenny, and all, and, and the massive amount. He had 20 and a half touches per game in the four playoff games last year. I'd rather go that route than have to make a decision on Moss or Singletary. Singletary's undersized. He is more of a change of pace back. Moss, in theory, should be a three down back, but they seem to be reluctant to use him in that way. I mean, if I absolutely had to pick, it would be Moss. Singletary already had that chance, too, when Moss was hurt last year. And then, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, TJ Yeldon's on the field. Oh, OK, uh, we're going to do that. Uh, Moss, but I don't like it, it uh, I guess, is my, my final answer on that one. Yeah, Singletary also had his rookie season where he didn't really do a hell, hell of a lot either. And then last yeah. year, certainly, I just feel like he just doesn't break a tackle. Yeah, I mean, that's pro- partially due to the size, I'm sure. He, he yeah. is really undersized. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, there you go, Jeff. A little leavened and or unleavened. There's, uh, you know, now we know which ones uh, we should be investing in. Although, still some murky situations here, but we got a good idea. Uh, big thank you to you for uh, for dropping by here, uh, sharing with us the bread making skills. Before I let you get out of here, do uh, you want to give a shout out to uh, maybe some pets of yours that uh, that I, I just learned that you own? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I do have four aquatic turtles, not the box ones. These guys swim around in tanks. Um, I've had them for a long time. Turtles live a long time. I think some of them have to be close to 20 years old. Um, but I have four of them. Uh, I have one who is named Jerry. Guess who he's named after, Howard? <laughs> All right, Seinfeld. Good job. Yes. Good job. Very Jewish. <laughs> who are nice. these turtles? Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, definitely. Well, here gives it away. I, the, I have a female named Scarlet after a, a, a song that was also mm-hmm. uh, from said band. Then uh, Timmy was named actually after uh, a, um, a Mo song. So sticking with the Timmy jam Tucker. band theme. Yes, sir. Yes, Look sir. You. And and then Sabi is uh, uh, the third, the fourth turtle. My wife named after a book that she uh, really dug growing up. Um, so that was that was like our turtle, right? So yeah, that's when you take the relationship to the next level. You get an aquatic <laughs> you turtle. You share the, hey, the aquatic turtle. turtle it's like, tell, tell me you're a nerd without telling me you're a nerd. I, I think I just accomplished that. I also have a dog named Lucy, so that's cool, too. She's a little beagle who's really loud and sometimes gets on. If you if you ever listen on Sirius XM, you're watching this right now, and you're like, oh, I've heard that dog. Yep, you have. <laughs> that means that, like, the UPS guy came while I was on air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's nothing better. I say to my wife. Uh, you know, she'll like let the dogs out in the backyard during the show and like right outside the door, they start wrestling with each other and growling and everything. I'm like two hours a day. That's all I ask is two hours a day to leave me in peace without the dogs. So Jeff, fantastic stuff, man. Great to get a chance to, uh, to, to see the other side of Jeff Radcliffe as well. It's not just nerdy A dot stuff. It's actually no nerdy A dot stuff. <laughs> nerdy bread stuff. Nerdy bread stuff. <laughs> bread stuff. I'm in on that, man. I'm in on that. Caraway seeds in your rye or no caraway seeds in your rye? That's a good question. You know, uh, several years ago, I probably would have said no, but I kind of dig them now. They, I, they're, it's, a, it's sort of an acquired taste, but I, I've acquired that taste. So, yeah, and, and I did do a rye bread once. Um, I should do more of those. They're, rye breads are really nice, man. That's a good call out. Yeah, Cara, I'm going caraway. I like it. I like it. Throw some pastrami on there, a little mustard. Bueno. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you so much again, man. Really appreciate it. And we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, guys. All right. So, again, big thanks to Jeff Radcliffe. And that sound right last there, call. you know, time for last call. Last call. Last call. Last call. So, Ryan, I said I was saving last. Yes. Well, you know what? I'm on the water already, dude. I'm a, little, I'm a little lightheaded right now. All that carb talk and bread talk has got me all, like, feeling yeasty. I'm not even sure what feeling yeasty means, but okay. I don't either. But it sounded kind of weird and a little gross and kind of naughty. But, nevertheless, I teased it earlier in the in the show. I was talking about what I was saved from my last call rant. Investing in injured players, like for people who are doing that. And I don't know what what your opinion is on this, Ryan. So I'll ask you, because for me, Michael Thomas, Saquon Barkley, 
uh, Kenny Galladay now. Uh, I'm out. I'm out. Like, I don't want to have to deal with the headache. Like, with Barkley, I get it. If if he were to fall into the second round, then maybe I would do it because he's not expected to miss the whole year, and I can use a late pick on Devontae Booker still to just kind of tie up that backfield. But, like, let's take Michael Thomas, for example, right? I'm not drafting Michael Thomas. Now, I dropped him in the cheat sheet, and I dropped him in the rankings, I said, yeah, he's probably going to, you know, his sweet spot right now for people is like right around the eighth round. All right. I'm not touching him there because even if he comes back and he's fine, now he's got to like gel with this offense again. He's got to gel with either Jameis Winston or Taysom Hill. Um, I mean, and, and for him to like really be that true value to be that guy I mean, so many things have to break right for him and for the Saints, for that matter, that, you know, to me, it's just not worth eating that bench spot for like the first seven, eight weeks of the season. I mean, maybe if you can just pop him onto an IR spot, you know, draft him and then do that. But then even so, you know, you're you're conceding a, a decent investment in a draft pick for a guy who's only going to play half the year. Well, and and I'll talk to this because I did draft Michael Thomas in exactly the eighth round in our Fantasy Alarm mock uh, earlier this week. And it, it just got to the point where I'm looking at the guys and I'm looking at Sterling Shepard and, and those kind of guys in that area. And I'm like, am I looking at difference makers here or am I not looking at difference makers here? He's not going to be out forever. Uh, and, and I don't know how much, you know, and I'm, we're talking Thomas specifically here. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how much gelling he needs to do with the offense when he's a nine yard slant guy uh, that I think even Taysom Hill can hit him with that. So in the Thomas, you know, I, I got the guy who when healthy can be, well, when healthy can be a first round pick, but you know, more legitimately probably a second round pick. If I'm taking the eighth round. Yeah. I mean, some things have to break right for him, but it's not like we're pulling in uh, Deandre Hopkins in the eighth round. So I, I feel like in this particular case, if we're getting that deep into the draft, I mean, he didn't die. I mean, his leg didn't fall off. Like, at some point, he's going to come back. If it's half the season, all right. I mean, that's that's a long time to, to hold a, an empty roster spot in fantasy football uh, because between the way guys get hurt and bye weeks, uh, every every roster spot in fantasy football is, is kind of – is not kind of valuable. It's very valuable. Uh, so if there is an IR spot, certainly that opens up the door where you should be thinking about Michael Thomas in the eighth. But even if he's not – uh, it's certainly still, to me, a guy of his caliber, I think, to wait to the eighth round, I think he's worth the, the, the possible headache. Well, there you go. I'll tell you what, I'd love to throw that out to, to people out there. You're watching this episode at Fighting Chance on Twitter, at Roto Buzz Guy. Um, I'll, we'll even we'll send out a tweet. We'll like clip this part here and find out. Are you in on these injured guys, or are you just going to let that be somebody else's headache? For me... I'm going to let it be Ryan's headache. Ryan, he wants to uh, pop a couple of Advil and draft Michael Thomas anyway. I love the headache. Give me the headache. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us here tonight. Big thanks to all of you for uh, for for subscribing to the uh, the channel and to, uh, and to watching a uh, little getting buzzed here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right more water here, Ryan. Uh, more more drink for me. I got a I got a. Oh, bleh, bleh. Big thank you over to Jeff Radcliffe for uh, for joining us here tonight. Always great to get a chance to talk to him. That's going to do it for Ryan Hallam and our producer, Matt Sells. I'm Howard Bender. This has been Getting Buzzed. We'll catch you next time. Mm-hmm.